Great many thanks for the invite and to Susan for suggesting me for this lecture. And thanks also to the SNP, my wife, uh, for her forbearance over Christmas and New Year. This truly has been a labour of love for me. I will tell you about Robert Burns in seven stories. These stories all have 27-year-old men in mind, a seminal year in the life of the Bard. Of course, I invite you all to listen because we were all 27 at one point, or we will be soon. <laughs> oh, and the opening of this lecture was designed well before I knew this was going to be in the John Anderson building. John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent. But now your brow is bell, John, your locks are like the snow. But blessings on your frosty pow, John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe, John, we clam the hill together in many a canty day, John. We've hid we're in another. Now we moan, totter down, John, and hand in hand we'll go and sleep together at the fit. John Anderson, my Joe. That makes me think of my mum and my late dad, who will sleep together again one day. But not too soon, mummy. <laughs> In two verses, Burns tells is the story of a married life. Robert Burns never had hair of snow. He went downhill when he could have been in his prime, arriving in Edinburgh, age 27, looking 10 years older. How did you get here? I mean that literally, not metaphysically. Burns' journey would have been miserable and arduous. Six miles an hour by carriage dropped off at Trongate. Burns most likely would have saddled his mare leaving tomorrow before first light because every daylight hour in January was as precious then as Wi-Fi is now. Why are you here? I mean that literally too. Out of duty? Are you a relative? Hello, Matthew. Perhaps you don't have a telly. With luck, you are curious about how poverty shaped Robert Burns and what that tells us about ourselves in the same soil. A split second after the board left his mark, there are over 60 statues the world over, including Pope's Corner, Westminster Abbey, next to that other bard. At 14, Burns was doing the work of a full-grown farmhand, but in truth, will have been raising lambs, chopping sticks and howking tatties when we were starting school. At 30, he was an exciseman, riding 200 miles a week. All his life, lassies and laddies, Robert Burns had to put a shift in. This was not the fate of William Shakespeare, or James Boswell, or Samuel Johnston. At 14, the English bard left his grammar school after six intensive years. The ninth Laird of Auchinleck arrived at the University of Edinburgh to study the arts. And Robbie Coltrane, the dictionary man, was a few years off attending Pembroke College, Oxford. It's quite something that Burns wrote much at all. Burns' life ended at 37 and he really did not want to go, bemoaning his decrepitude to his boss at the excise the week before his daft final journey. Weep that burns with raging toothache and a weak heart, a big heart, but a weak heart, was sent 10 miles from his home in Dumfries to bathe daily in the freezing Solway Firth. My last doctor's visit was arranged electronically at a time of my choosing. In a pleasant, if Spartan, room, my entire medical history before him, 
a highly qualified stranger had me bend over and hum my favourite tune. A fond kiss, but not out loud. He put a gloved finger on my donut and told me it was still not a bagel. Two weeks later, I was back to give blood. They tested me for everything, for I am 57. In his lifetime, Burns might have caught smallpox, typhoid, or malaria. He did have depression and finally rheumatic fever. Treatment for everything was a herbal tincture or purging. Dr. Maxwell truly was Burns' last true friend, but a useless medic. Burns shared his farmhouses he lived and vomited in with his family, servant girls, farm hands, relatives down in their luck, and livestock. He never repaired to his study with snuff, port, and a lamp, but sat with a candle by a peat fire or went up to the attic in the gloaming. Not for Burns, the three-story townhouse just off Fleet Street. It's little wonder Samuel Johnson found the time to write that dictionary. When I walked past the bronze of Johnson's cat, Hodge, on my way to Pret, I often wonder why Robert Burns never took his chances in London. Porridge was for life, not just breakfast back then. It never came with honey, seeds, and a banana. <laughs> My old grandpa, 50 years ago, Oswald Wardrobe, used to have a handful of salt in his oats, but my gran slipped me some sugar. Scotland's climate, ladies and gentlemen, ruined, ruined many a crop, and it drove Burns to despair. Life expectancy was 40, and it was a coin toss if you escaped infancy. So Burns' death was not unexpected. Death never was. Everything you hear about Burns must be understood in the context of life in 18th century Scotland. Truly, we have no idea. Now, I delivered my first immortal memory to Robert Burns this very week, 30 years ago, in the men's union at the University of Glasgow. Having heard Worthies wax lyrical at posh suppers, I took a different tack and proposed that the bard was known to his closest friends as Shagger Bob. Yes, I'm going to say that again. I took a different tack and I proposed that Burns was known to his closer friends as Shagger Bob. Well, here it's not any better the second time. <laughs> Burns founder of the Tarbolton Bachelors Club, would have loved it. Try to cancel him if you fancy, ladies and gents, you won't get all the statues. When I was 27, I delivered Shagger Bob is Immortal. Everything you need to know about Robert Burns can be gleaned from his 27th year. It is a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. Yuval Noah Harry tells us in Sapiens our stories are what makes us unique. I will tell Burns' story in seven tales aimed at today's 27-year-old men. Because 27 is an age where you need to get to it, laddies. If you like everything, I'm doing it wrong. If you dislike everything, you're doing it wrong. Burns grew into manhood that year. So let's begin. Story number one. Shit happens. At 35, Robert Burns was set. There was money, there was a good job with the excise, promotion on the horizon, a nice house, his extended family working the farm, respectability, self-acceptance, and a little fame as a poet. Yet at 37, he was dead. Shit happens. Burns' father, William, was the best dad anyone could wish for, but he lived and died in poverty, worse than his sons. If you had a less than perfect childhood, know that Burns never had a childhood at all, and Burns was lucky. 
Fate gave the word, the arrow sped and pierced my darling's heart. And with him, all the joys are fled. Life can to me impart a lament for a mother losing a child. We have all but forgotten the motivational force that is our own mortality. You must muffle the voices telling you everything will be all right, all will fall your way, the world cares about you. It won't, it can't, and it doesn't. Politicians tell us life will be better with independence or the union. Brexit or remain. Take it all with a huge sack of salt. Or in the words of Ricky Gervais, it's all jokes. We'll all be dead soon. Life is suffering and death are the truest words you will ever hear, as well as being a great Twitter handle. By the age of 27, Burns had a belly full of suffering and death. Hard labour that compromised his health forever. Only a few hours education a day. Two surviving children from the first six births. In the 18th century, Scotland, suffering and death happened every day in the most egregious ways. Richard Dawkins tells us we have 0% chance of even being here. And Seneca says to wake up every day expecting the worst. Well, amen to both. Accept life, accept life will throw 70 shades of shit at you, and you are lucky to be in this small, simmering sphere at all. Then you will be free to celebrate every day Expecting the worst does not preclude hoping for the best. So story number one, shit happens. Story number two, you are m &S laddies, laddies. My mum at 80 can likely enjoy a further decade of lunches at the local trattoria. Then coming home to walk the dog before gin o'clock. She still drives her Ford Focus to see the great grandkids. Your future lives will be better than my mum's and Italian will still be the go-to cuisine laddies. You are the most fortunate young men ever to have lived. You are healthier, wealthier, safer, longer lived, more equal and happier than any human beings that have popped out, popped in and will pop their mortal coil. Hans Rosling's factfulness gives you the data. Pinker tells us why we are prone to pessimism. Read both. Read Pinker twice if you're the life sucker who everyone avoids at the water cooler. Then go back a generation or two. Then a century or two. And then 50 more years. And there you will find Robert Burns. Shall we put a cherry on top? You are living in one of the best places on this toasty wee sphere. A place so cool that many risk everything just to get here. To paraphrase Warren Buffett, if you are born here, you have already won the lottery. Those thinking we will we'll all be gone soon, burnt to a crisp, should no Puritans have been predicting our extinction since Robert Burns saw a lassie and wrote a rhyme. In fantasy land, how America went haywire, Kurt Anderson lists the many times Armageddon has been prophesied. Just like today's Puritans, it's only the date that changes. Laddies, laddies. What would you do if you were not scared? Living in panic and fear is futile and merely a self-justification not to grow up. Fear stalked Burns' whole life, rooted in his poverty, his father's poverty, and that of the entire nation in the wake of the Darien debacle. Not forgetting to throw in the upcoming French Revolution and the, recently, the fallout from the recent American independence. Despite all that, Burns packed quite a bit into his less than two score years. I think you would agree. At 27 laddies, it's time. What will you do with your five score years? Story number three. Happiness 
is a chimera. The mental and physical strength required to create poetry day after day working in the land was quite something. And thinking fast and slow, Daniel Kahneman talks about two ways of thinking. The first is fast, instinctive and emotional, and the second slower, deliberate and logical. You need both in high amount for any creative endeavour. Burns would have an inspired thought in the day, but the hard yards didn't come till the evening. A lassie at harvest, his first rhyme. Once I loved a bonnie lass, aye, and I love her still. And whilst that virtue warms my breast, I love my handsome Nell. A mouse, still thou art blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee. But och, I backwards cast my e on prospects drear. And forward, though I can see, I guess and fear. A dog. His hair, his size, his mouth, his words. Sure, he was near of Scotland's ducks. But whap it someplace for abroad, where sailors gang to fish for cod. A letter about the lassies. There's a lot about the lassies. He liked the lassies. My heart was completely tender. Burns would have loved tender. <laughs> and eternally lighted by some goddess or another. And like every warfare in this world, I was sometimes crowned with success and sometimes mortified with defeat. Burns was prodigious given his constraints because he had found his muse in poetry. But it was never easy. Young laddies, nothing worth doing is ever easy. It takes focus, effort and commitment. Any elite coach, ask any elite coach to rack attitude, ability and coaching in order. Attitude comes first every single time. Scottish tennis player Andy Murray was number four in the world with an 80 mile per hour second serve. Once he got over 100 miles per hour, he started winning majors. Focus, effort and commitment gave him that extra 20 miles per hour. So here's what you have to do, young men. Issue happiness and seek purpose. Take the high road, not the low road. Burns did. He had no choice. The conditions for turning wet clay into gold were far from ideal. They never are. But poverty of circumstances was what begat his poetry. Ignore the siren call of the four day week because those who propose it have never worked 20 hours, 20 hours a week in their entire lives. Scotland could do worse than appoint a government czar for hard work. It is time to find your purpose, laddies, and to decide what you are willing to sacrifice to achieve it. Poetry was his muse. But Burns came out of his 27th year with a higher purpose than rhyming. His famous platonic dalliance with Agnes McElhose from Cessnock produced personal frustration, I think top half only, and Aphon Kiss. Shelley said Aphon Kiss contains the essence of a thousand love songs. A fun kiss and then we sever. A farewell and then forever. Deep in her drunk tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. Who can say that fortune grieves him? 
While the star of hope she leaves him, me nature food twinkle lights me. Dark despair around benights me. I'll ne'er blame my partial fancy. Nothing could resist my Nancy. But to see her was to love her. Love with her and love forever. Had we never loved, say blindly, had we never loved, say kindly, never met or never parted, we had never been broken hearted. Fear the will thou first and fearest. Fare thee weel, thou best and dearest, thine be elka joy and treasure, peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure. If on kiss and then we sever, if er weel, alas, forever. Deep in her drunk tears, I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans, I'll wage thee. A future of Clorinda fame and high society was not for Burns, her Sylvander. He chose Jean, farming and the common wheel. Burns chose what he knew. I shall sit down a plain farmer, he said. The happiest of lives, if one can live by it. But just like uh, getting to the West Indies in the 18th century, the route to a bucolic life in Dumfries would not be plain sailing. Oh, pale, pale now those rosy lips, I aft, he kissed so fondly, and closed for aye the sparkling glance that dwelt on me so kindly. And mouldering now in silent dust the heart that loved me dearly, but still within my bosom's core shall live my Highland Mary. Those are amongst the saddest words you will ever hear. Mary Campbell, Highland Mary, died in childbirth, waiting for Burns in Greenock. A real tragedy. I mean, Greenock. Counting people of colour off faraway fields was not something James Boswell had to countenance. Around that time, the ninth laird of Auchinleck was buying the Edinburgh home of David Hume and trying hard to catch the disease he would die of. Shit happens to everyone. Burns met Mary when he was on tilt after having been told to sling his hook by a respectable Mocklin builder. Gene Armour's, farmer, Gene Armour's father was pissed he was to become a grandfather to twins, sired by a well-kent, feckless, penniless rogue and founder of the Tarbolton Bartlers Club, Bachelors Club, Shagger Bob. Gene Armour was packed off by mum and dad to cool off in Paisley. The problem for the Armours was Gene still had the hots for bad boy Bob. Plus I change, plus I mem shows. By the end of his 27th year, Burns was in Edinburgh, where his star burned bright and flamed out fast. He was too chippy, inflexible, and talented for the menfolk, and the posh Edinburgh lassies flirted with him, but never followed through. The problem in Ayrshire was too much following through. In short order, Burns had two women pregnant, a book of poems selling like haggis on the 24th of January, money to collect from all over Ayrshire, a subscription, crowdfunding essentially, for his Edinburgh edition to sort, a ticket to the plantations in his sporran, a lease for a Dumfries farm to sort out, exams for the excise, and a whole pile of other shenanigans. They all needed 
letters and visits in a drama or seven by the charismatic farmer now cleverly marketing himself as the heaven tall ploughman. It was intense. It was too intense. Something had to give. So Burns got a break in his 27th year. He got two big breaks in his 27th year. Burns' two big breaks were the death of Mary Campbell and his poems being more popular than Ricky Gervais at the Golden Globes. The first got him out of a Gordian knot and the second into some real cash, softening the hearts of Jean Armour and her parents. Eventually, Rab and Jean were married. Mr and Mrs Armour, what did you see in the recently popular, successful and rich young poet, Shagger Bob? Of all the airs the wind can blow, I dearly like the west, for there the bonny lassie lives, the lassie I love best, where wild winds blow and rivers row, and many a hill between, but day and night my fancy's flight is ever with my jean. In truth, Burns knew he had only recently become man enough, had enough substance to be the husband of the builder's daughter. Mr and Mrs Burns, had loads of kids, burns a few more than Jean, funnily enough. <laughs> Many died in infancy. Burns just about lived as a farmer and a family man, just about. Though Ellisland went the way of all his other farms and was sold at a loss. The family decanted to a house in town and another bastard Wayne appeared for Jean to nurse. Laddies, an imperfect man can still be a man of substance. Story number four. Be more Billy. At 10 o'clock one Saturday night in 1975, on the Parkinson show, a big bearded Scotsman, against all advice, told a politically incorrect joke about murdering his wife. The punchline, I needed somewhere to park my bike, started Billy Connolly on a journey to worldwide fame. The crucifixion. Hey Peter, I can see your hoosfie here. The territorial army. I make 40 pounds a week all told and I keep the lock because I'm a selfish bastard. My favourite, Ivan the Terrible. I'm sure many of you remember it. Ivan the Terrible, it's amazing the surge of strength you get when you bite your own woolly. These were punchlines from my teenage years. The big one is remembered the world over because he left. He was set in Scotland. He could have stayed. Both are global superstars. Burns has more statues than Billy, but Billy got to enjoy the spotlight. In To a Mouse, Burns says... He can't see the future. It was certainly not a strong suit. And when he did, it was dark and poverty-stricken. At 35, living in town in Dumfries, near the pubs, Burns was offered a job in London. It paid handsomely and promised a host of other lucrative opportunities. But he was dying. Shit happens. It's never easy to make a living from a creative enterprise. But at 27, ladies and gentlemen, in his pomp, the ten pounds and three days that would have taken the ploughman poet to London would be the best tenor a Scotsman ever spent. And we don't like to spend money we've not got. Material poverty weakened his constitution and helped him to an early grave. But it was the poverty of Robert Burns' only, own imagination that stymied him, never giving London a serious thought. 
Connolly paid the price in the press for his leaving and for some of the friends he kept. But in the context of all that, his life, that sledging was loose change. And my, what a journey the biggies having. So laddies, give it everything at 27. Be ambitious, be bold, be fearless, be more Billy. Story number five, your own personal Jesus. In the summer of 2019, Peugeot used Depeche Mode's brilliant, your own personal Jesus to advertise their new SUV. The vehicle type with heaviest responsibility for the present poaching of our planet. If you have one of these daft vehicles, never mention the straw in my pina colada, even if I have it in Tenerife. Today we are in an era of useless empathy, where we can pretend to, to, where we can pretend to care about everything and do precisely nothing. Today we donate money to a food bank without ever seeing one, unless we go at Christmas to feel virtuous for a day. In Burns Day, you heard the poor at your door, gave to them what little you had, and took them in to your modest home. We collect Twitter followers, but don't know our neighbours, not even the name of the newborn next door. In Burns Day, you'd know the bairn's name and likely attend its funeral. Before he settled down, Burns was a bit of a lad. Poetry, Hokma Gandhi, and drinking were his thing. Plus a change, plus some M shows. Public parents at the Kirk, kneeling on the cutty stool, was Burns' punishment for, for, well, I'll let you tell him. I'll let him tell you himself. Before the congregation wide, I passed the muster fairly. My handsome Betsy at my side, we got a ditty rarely. But my downcast eye by chance did sky, which made my lips to water. Those limbs between, where I between, commenced a fornicator. Much of it was own making, but Burns was compromised at every turn. Contraception, feminism, and social media would have made his romantic life a different proposition. Free education and a more meritocratic business environment would have allowed him self-improvement and much personal freedom. Modern modes of transport and communication would have made the world a much smaller place. He can now get to London in an hour. Burns would marvel at our lives. No need to be or stay married. Marketing jobs that paid handsomely just for ideas. 12 cans of cider for under a tenner. You laddies of three score years ahead of you. And this warming world is at your feet, just as it was for Burns and Billy. At 27, you're as useful as a chocolate fire guard, unless you got up early, stay late, and find some focus. But here's the rub for your future laddies. How you balance self-interest and taking one for the common wheel will be the biggest conundrum in your future years. And you'd be quite right if you would say we must climb the hill together. A pressing need, as we are often at daggers drawn, coming out of our shells only to virtually jab or block someone not in our tribe. How often today do we listen to those with whom we disagree and find out what their own personal Jesus is whispering in their ear? <coughs> Story six. Wear sunscreen. If I could offer you only one tip for the future, Sunscreen would be it. Laddies, you could do worse than say, Alexa, play Everybody's Free to wear sunscreen every single morning. 
your own personal Baz Luhrmann. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. But be smart enough, laddies, to know they fade, and then you need to be competent, reliable, and industrious. Respect your elders. Be skeptical, not cynical. Boomers know stuff. Do one thing every day that scares you. Aristotle would force Alexander the Great to swim the Tiber every morning before class. So what did Alexander do? He got up an hour earlier and did it before his teacher arrived. <laughs> Don't be reckless with other people's hearts. Don't put up with people who are reckless with yours. Play nice, laddies, but do not be, be afraid to be a man. Imagine you are your own best friend and be kind to yourself. Finding the sweet spot between single-minded self-fulfillment, be more Billy, and the common wheel is a challenge we have been grappling with forever. The pace increasing since the 60s. This is John Donne, 200 years before Burns. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed up away by the sea, Europe is the less. Plus I change, plus I meme shows. Two centuries ago, everyone knew your business and it was impossible to disengage from your neighbours. Now we can virtually live as far away from them as we fancy. Two generations ago, we knew our neighbours. We went to church. Friday was scouts and the, only the farmer's kids were dropped off at school in an SUV. <coughs> Two years ago, I opened the eulogy to my dad with this story I'm about to tell you. It happened when I was 14. The age Burns was when he started work as a full-grown man. 300 went on their journey at my dad's funeral, many telling me about Hugh Wardrop in the Eglinton Arms Hotel over soup and a sausage roll. John Dunn never met my dad, who could be reached but only via a bridge. Fortunately, he married Jean, Isambard Kingdom Brunel McEachan. Hugh Wardrop is the embodiment of the Nietzschean view that we must be prepared for the savagery legitimately demanded by almost everything valuable. His capacity for hard work was simply awe-inspiring. Stoic, Single-minded and taciturn, my dad would have hated his eulogy as much as he loved his soup. Laddies, stoicism, single-mindedness and being taciturn are not toxic traits. They are just out of fashion. A flatbed lorry outside a neighbour's house, women's playing in the pile of chuckies in the back, high on lime green E numbers from the Alpine man. Teenagers mooching around all spots and flares. The lorry driver is having a smoke, chatting with someone's dad. It's tea time in the hot summer of 1976. So hot! You can smell the soft tarmac on the pavements of Eaglesome. A burgundy rover fastback swings past and stops at 6 Brownmuir Avenue. The lorry driver nips his fag and in jig time, Hugh Wardrop is striding towards us. Two shovels in one hand and six heavy duty plastic sacks in the other. Tie tucked in. Sleeves rolled up, brown moccasins on fast-moving feet. His tongue is out. 
He sends a wee one to get half a dozen carrier bags. Gideon's mind, two bigger boys now have shovels and are up, up on top, filling bags held by two smouts. Holding a bag for a fast shoveling shoe wardrobe was the worst job in the world. Now we are shuttling back and forth in the heat, humping chuckies. Hugh Wardrop takes two bags at a time. Half an hour later, he palms the driver a fiver, picks up his shovels and bags, and goes in for his fish tea. Inside an hour, he'll be sleeping on the couch, watching telly. My dad arranged that lorry. My dad employed that driver for 20 years. My dad got those chuckies at a good price because he knew folk. There were 20 men and boys in the chain gang, as many as lived in Ellis and Farm, Dumfries, when Burns, with Burns when he briefly felt he had his own personal Jesus just for a few years. Burns had his own personal Jesus just for a little while. My uncle Gavin, grandpa's brother, Loaned my dad £1,135, money that allowed a man with no secondary education, 15 years later, to sell the biggest industrial waste business in Scotland. His, big, his business cleaned up the biggest messes human beings make. The fruits of a few Wardrop's labours rippled through our immediate and wider family to friends, neighbours, community groups and the wider community. Hundreds of employees. Many mourners at the funeral had started their own businesses inspired by my dad, borrowing his shovels, plastic bags and overalls, recycling before it was trendy. It is no coincidence that I started my business at 35, the age he was when he started his the age Robert Burns was when he started going down the hill. <coughs> That's your blueprint. That's your blueprint, laddies. That is your blueprint. Find your focus. Go out and get busy. Give something back. But before you try to change the world, do a bit of work on your second serve. Story number seven. Joy. The common wheel will remain intangible, as intangible as gold at the end of a rainbow if we continue to demonise our fellow travellers, if we can't stop cancelling everyone outside our narrow tribe, stop using hyperbole to monster others, reflect more, type less. It can start today. Then gently scan your fellow man Still gentler, sister woman. Though, me, though they may gang a kin and rang, just step aside as human. Step aside and you will become more content and mindful in this wonderfully warm world. You can call it happiness, if that will make your tofu tastier. But I prefer joy, because it's obvious you can't always be joyful. Leave joy be, and it will be yours. Stay in the present, do the work, and don't compare yourself too much to others. There will always be someone taller, thinner, richer, and better looking than you. Then joy will come. It will come to you every single day, and in 1,000 ways. Burns knew it was always there in the shadows. A pretty girl by a river. Flow gently, sweet after, among thy green braes. Flow gently, I'll sing thee a song in thy praise. My Mary's asleep by thy murmuring stream. Flow gently, sweet after, disturb not her dream. Thy crystal stream often, how lovely it glides and winds by the court where my Mary resides. How wanton thy waters, her snowy feet lave, as gathering sweet flowerets, she stems thy clear wave. 
a drink with friends, while we sit bowsing at the nappy and getting foo and unku happy. And finally, spring flowers, winter snow. But pleasures are like poppy spread. You seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like the snowfalls in the river, one moment white, then gone forever. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Burns. Thank you very much. The, uh, thank you very much, that was fascinating. Um, on the introductory sheet it says, uh, the poverty of the society he lived in and the poverty of his own imagination. Now, are you defining imagination there uh, purely in terms of fame and material wealth? No. <laughs> no. I think that I think that if you if you compare him with someone like Billy Connolly, who had got huge fame and material wealth, um, obviously if he went to London, in fact, the job that he was offered in London when he was 35 promised him. I think it was five guineas a week or a month, which was four times what he was earning at the excise, with a promise that he could have earned more as, as a writer down there. So there's no question in my mind that Burns would have, would have achieved more material wealth had he gone to London, yeah? But that's not really it. What I think we might have missed out on was Burns... Uh, I think he was scared of being a journalist down in London, but he might have written plays for the Garrick, so he might have expanded his repertoire of his creative uh, uh, poems and prose and maybe plays if he'd gone to London. I think the byproduct of that would have been material wealth, no question about that. But I think that his circumstances and his lack of imagination forbade him from going to London. And ironically, his first teacher, John Murdoch, ended up in London. Many people who knew Burns, despite the fact it took three days to get there, went to London so he could have gone. So I think what I would say, apart from material wealth, what I would say we missed out on was the opportunity for Burns to expand his um, legacy by uh, going to somewhere like London. But he decided, I think he decided specifically at 27 simply not to do that. Not, not to do it. Yeah. Do you not feel that he developed his imagination much more effectively by simply doing what he did in Scotland? Yes, I think that's another really good point because, because there's no question that his muse was the land. And, and, and I think he possibly... Another thing is somebody who spends a lot of time in London. You know, he might have felt that if he'd gone there... His muse would have gone because he, he loved the land, he loved the, the, the landscape of Scotland, he loved the people of Scotland. So maybe that's another thing that stopped him, that he thought, I won't have, the embankment in London won't hold the same cachet for me. So there's no question that his decision to stay was based on Gene not Clorinda to some extent was based on farming not becoming a, a celebrity or a writer or a journalist and those things were, were active decisions whereas if you look at Billy Connolly he decided no I'm going for it yeah so I absolutely agree that the possibility is that he would have lost the muse if he'd gone to London and we did get a lot of output from him between the age of 27 and early 30s, mid 30s, there's no question. But I'm just positing that down in London he might have given us a lot more. I'm not that convinced about Sorry, could you just... that we're talking of the poverty he yeah. had. What we have now is instant access to media. And Billy Connolly made it because he managed to get onto the Parkinson show, mm. which was seen nationwide. Yep. And he came out of Scotland and he was a breath of fresh air. Now, whether you like Billy Connolly or not is neither here nor <coughs> there. But he came out with that. Burns did not have that. I agree. He published in Kilmarnock and he published in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So there was a poverty of communication. Yep. Now, was he about now? different ball game. Oh, it'd be different now, but here's an interesting he, thing. He, you would, do... he would have been on social media yeah. and had his blog and been on YouTube. 
etc, etc, etc. I completely agree, but I think the interesting thing is, I did say in my introduction that any, any lens through which you see Burns has to be seen through the fact that he was working in, in, the, in the, 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 the 18th century. But if you look at it interestingly enough, there was a London edition of his poetry of his poems, and it was called the Stinking Edition, interestingly enough. Now, those of you who know the haggis, all Scotland wants nae skinking wear that jouts and luggies, yeah? You know, what they did was they spelled it wrongly in the London edition. It was all Scotland wants nae stinking wear that jouts and luggies. Now, the interesting thing is there was a London edition and there was a Dublin edition. Now, these were pirated to a large extent, and they were published by people on the Strand. Now, I walk along the Strand every bleeding week nearly. Now I appreciate it's much easier to, to go now than it ever was. But here's the interesting thing. There are countless people in Burns' time that went to London. Uh, countless. And I do think that it would have been different then to make it. It would have made it in a different way. Samuel Johnson had just died. James Boswell had just died of something really horrible. But James Boswell was up and down to London all the time. So if he'd gone down there as... He was a good marketer, Burns. If he'd, if he'd gone down there as, as, as the ploughman. Yeah, the ploughman poet. Um, they like Scottish people in London. They still, I, I, they liked, okay, there was the independence thing back then and the Act of Union that might have been a wee bit more difficult. But I do think that, 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 that if, he'd, if he'd gone where he was maybe, may, maybe in his mid-twenties. Now, here's the further thing I would say about 27. And the man at the age of 27, I tried to explain to you what his life was like. It was crazy in his 27th year, so I don't think he knew what way was up. I really don't. But if he had taken that chance, if he had taken that chance, I firmly believe that for good or ill, he had the talent to make it. But I appreciate there are a whole pile of reasons that made it very, very... I find it ironic that he was willing to counter his going to the West Indies which was just a, a, a crazy thing to try. It could have killed him. He was told, this will kill you. But he couldn't spend the tenor to go to London. And it's not meant to be a, a huge criticism of him. We got a lot of poetry from him. I just think there's a different life that could have happened there if he'd given it the chance. Could have. Could have. Okay, the lady just in front. Right. Um, I first, uh, my first encounter with Burns was through an open university course where, where he was presented as an introduction to the, <coughs> dare I say, English Romantics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering, had he, gone, had he gone down to London and presumably sort of written um, in English for the theatre and uh, written poetry in English? We, I mean, we know he could write perfectly well in English, yep. but chose to write in Scots. Yes. Um, would he have been... Um, I mean, was it a fairly shrewd move for him to remain in Scotland and write in Scots rather than... and be unique, yeah. rather than go down to England and be um, part of a group with Wordsworth and Coleridge and yep. the other early romantics? Yeah, I think, I, th I think the first thing I would say about that, and I was going, you've stolen part of my thunder there, he was perfectly capable of writing in English. So it didn't have to be Scots. That's the first thing. But... Um, I think that going down to England and writing in English with all those other successful people, I mean, Samuel Johnston wasn't long dead, but there was, there was Richard Sher Sheridan and Thomas Sheridan, a guy called Tommy Sheridan, how funny is that? Uh, now, Tommy Sheridan went about, Irish, Irish, Irish heritage, both of these people, his father and son, these people were over and back to Dublin all the time, and I think Richard Brinsley Sheridan ended up, uh, Sheridan ended up running the Garrick Theatre. So when I walk round theatre land in London and I see what is there and the scale of it and size of it, again, I come back to it, he might have made an active decision not to go but I think the Scottish poet down there doing his thing in the wake of Johnson and maybe get some introduction from Boswell and he did, knew, he did know people down there I do think that he would have if he'd given it a shot he could have been as big as Billy Connolly in a different era of course and there was loads of women in London I'm sure and he liked women sort of, I think <laughs> he could have shouted. Uh, so, it's related to your, your comments about the, the difficulties he faced, obviously due to the, the situation he was in societally and, and, and relative to the time, but surely his success was a product of the time because 
his romantic style of poetry would not have fit into the empiricism of the Enlightenment era that, yeah. that had come sort of around that time. And it was necessary that, that he be in that period. For had he yeah. been in any other period, people would have gone, oh, this is a bit nonsense. I don't really yeah. like that. It's not, it's, you know, he was following yeah. certain artistic trends. Yes. And so he, he probably wouldn't have been as successful today or 50 years later or 50 years earlier. I, th I think that's a really good point and I spend a lot of my life talking about various things related to this. I think that there are lots of talented people that don't get lucky. Yeah. Now Burns really was on the cusp. I'm sure he was. He was on the cusp of going to the West Indies from Greenock. Yeah, right on there. And if he'd gone there, I don't believe we'd have got any more poetry. He might even have copped it on that. Now he was literally about to go, and he knew he had some good poems. He knew he had some good stuff, and no doubt round the pubs and all that, oh, Burns has got a good poem, and he'd written some out on a slate, he'd written some out. And the Kilmarnock edition, yeah, when it came out, just went crazy. And then he goes to Edinburgh. And here's the funny thing about that. And again, it's difficult to understand from 250 years later. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do an Edinburgh edition rap. It'll be great. And he thinks it's just going to be as easy as doing the Kilmarnock one. But no, 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 no. There's a whole pile of the Edinburgh hoi polloi involved. And it becomes much more complicated. And then he nearly chucks it. And he, he, gets, he does his calculations. He's going to make 20 pounds from 1,000 copies in Edinburgh. And I think he's thinking, these people are robbing me. Yeah, so I think, I think that obvious, he was definitely of his time, yeah? And I think that a lot of the stuff that he wrote, there is no question that it came from the land and the landscape of Scotland. I mean, I mean, you know, how wanton thy waters, her snowy feet lave, as gathering sweet flowerets, she stems I clear wave. You know, the lyrical stuff is just astonishing, and it's very, very Scottish, very Scottish. In terms of the Enlightenment and all the other contemporaneous poems, I'm not an expert on that by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think, again, if you have talent, right, and I was, in fact, here's a, here's a wee story from you from London from last week, I was, I, had, I, fi I finished a course in London last week and I was going with, uh, I was walking with a Canadian lassie, <laughs> got my wife's here, I was walking with a Canadian lassie to the, to the tube station, eh? and she was talking about London, and she said, this is a great place you can make it here. It's a cosmopolitan city where if you've got talent, they'll give you a chance. And I believe it would have been like that back then. And I think if he'd gone down there with his unpowdered hair, his ponytail, looking like a, an Ayrshire farmer, five foot ten, dark hair, good looking, big boots, white trousers and all that kind of stuff, I think he would have knocked them dead. I, even, and it's not all about the poetry. It's about the whole, he was good at marketing himself, and I think he could have done, he could have done really well. But yeah, to your point. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Russell. In 250 years, will anyone know who Billy Connolly is? <laughs> Actually, I was told, I was told, I was, I was, I was talking to Gideon, uh, 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 I was asking about this stuff, and I've lectured it here before. He says, uh, yeah, your lecture's going to be fine, it's the questions you have to watch out for. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, you know, when I do the three, the three punchlines or the four punchlines I gave you from Colin Connolly, I'm pretty sure most of the people in this audience would remember most of those punchlines. And I can actually distinctly remember when my mum first went to see Billy Connolly, she came back and said, that's a very, very rude man, I'm never going to see him again. <laughs> and then proceeded to buy every, every single one of his records and go to all his concerts. <laughs> so the crucifixion and uh, the, the uh, territorial army, and particularly Ivan the Terrible, are, are at the time were just side-splittingly funny. But a little aside about the, that I needed somewhere to park my bike joke. I had some more stuff in the lecture than that one. I'm sitting there as a 14-year-old thinking, I don't think that's that funny. I knew loads of folk that, that were, we knew loads of folk in Glasgow who were like that, who were a bit profane and a bit rude. But it seemed down in England that it was, oh, this is, this is something special. I'm just buying time here, by the way, to, before I give you an answer. I'm trying, to th I'm trying to think of stuff like A Fon Kiss or Flow Gently Sweet After, etc., that Billy Connolly would leave behind. And I'm probably thinking, I'm, I'm struggling to find that. But that could go back to the fact that, I mean, how many poets do we have today? 
you know, there are not that many world famous poets. So if Burns was about today, he might have been a filmmaker or a or a or, or another kind of media person. But I take your point, I think we'll remember Burns forever. <laughs> Because he was pretty good at doing that branding stuff, and so were the folk behind him. And maybe not quite so much Billy. Maybe just big Billy's big yellow boots. The banana ones. Good question. <laughs> I wondered, do you think that if Burns had been a wealthy man rather than a poor man, his drinking and his womanizing mm. would have been less or more? Oh, I love these questions. Um, I tried to get this across, but what happens when you're doing something that's got to be 45 minutes long, there's a lot of stuff left in the cutting room floor. I tried to get across that Robert Burns wasn't actually poor. So actually, his, his father was really poor. Uh, but actually Burns, when he got to his mid-twenties, his late-twenties, and between 27 and, say, when he died, by comparison with the rest of the population, he was not a poor man. Um, I think that, like anything, if you come from poverty or whatever it would be, that forums you. He, he really had another reason I think he stayed. He was really a man for the common weal. He really believed in egalitarianism, properly believed in it. He really despised, I think too strongly actually, the hoi polloi who got above themselves. And I think that maybe stopped him from making it in Edinburgh or going to London. In terms of the drinking, I don't think Burns was as dissolute as many of the other poets. He certainly wasn't as dissolute as Mr. Boswell, the ninth Laird of Auchinleck, and a number of other ones. So, um, it's funny, he didn't have that much time for poetry because he had to work so much. I don't know if he had that much time for Hockma Gandhi or drinking either. But I mean, he did like both. But I mean, I mean, for God's sake, who doesn't? I mean, we all do. Yeah. So, if he'd made it, gone down to London and really made it, he could have become just a complete dissolute lech, I suppose. That might have been disastrous for him because he still had to work. Um, but I think that his reputation for all that stuff is sometimes a little bit overblown. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not, there was, there was a, a biography done not long after he died which kind of was a bit sensorious and, sen and sensational and that stuck a little bit. So I'm not sure he was that bad. Um, and obviously, I don't know, contraception, the CSA and social media would have been much better for him these days because, I mean, the, the poem I told about the fornicator, uh, that was his first, his first penance at the cutty stool, Elizabeth Payton, who he got pregnant and she had a kid and all that kind of stuff. So, he was, you know, he was just a, I don't know, typical man really, was he? <laughs> have I said that out loud? <laughs> oh, you're wrong there. Oh, I don't think I am. <laughs> Thanks, Russell. That was excellent. Uh, I'm really glad that I came. And coincidentally, before I came, I was in Curlers and um, was chatting with the barman, and he told me he was 26 years of age. <laughs> Now, I have committed, because he started talking about studying sociology and various things, I said, look, I need to come back and we need to talk some careers advice. So in any case, um, these seven stories that you've yeah. told, are, they're, they're a beautiful um, part that I'll be able to um, yeah. pass on to him. But so this is the question. I, I think it's my hearing that's going. I heard the, the titles of the six of the seven stories. Yeah. But I never heard number two correctly, I don't think. What, did you, what was number two? <laughs> Just check your notes. <laughs> They're over there. I think it's Shit Happens. No, Shit Happens was number one. Or number one. Aye, Shit Happens was number one. Did you not say something like, your M&S laddies? Yeah, your M&S laddies. Sorry, I had various names for that. Your M&S laddies, yes. M and that means you're not. That means you're not just normal lad laddies, you're not just normal fortunate laddies, you are M&S laddies. You are the best laddies the most, at the most opportune time ever. Marks and Spencers? Marks and Spencers, M&S. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No S&M, M&S. <laughs> 
So just on, on that one, and, I, and I, I, did, I did toy with whether to, to put that into the lecture because it added another dimension, but I wanted a purpose for this. And I'm glad you, you saw it because I, I passionately am of the view that young people today want the kind of guidance that's in those stories. You have to, you have to go for it and work hard. And I do, again, I, I specifically made it young laddie because I was 27 when I delivered my first immortal memory in the men's union. And Burns was 27 where he was, he had kind of made it as a poet, but he had to become a man. He had to make some big decisions. And I, I, I tried to get across in those seven stories that, that the metaphors of it's your time now. You, you have to stop just thinking you look cool and you can be one of the boys. You're not. You're a man. And it was difficult to get across in the, in the 45 minutes, but that's what I was trying to do with those seven stories. But yes, you are M&S laddies was the, was the number two. What do you think about the fact that although he was an egalitarian by reputation, he considered going to West Indies, where presumably he would have been an overseer of slaves or something. Oh no. man! You know, you know, I love, I love really interesting questions like that, and it gives me a chance. And once I've done seven and a half minutes in this and got on my soapbox, just somebody hit me with something. Um, it's 250 years ago. We have to stop cancelling people because they lived 100, 200, 250 years ago. We have to stop doing it. It is ludicrous. So 250 years ago, here's Burns. And I'm going to extend it further because he, because he was a Jacobite. He was a rebellion guy on the French Revolution. He sent guns to, to the French Revolution. And then, of course, when it got quite serious and the people in the UK were going... We don't like this French Revolution shit. They're chopping people's heads off. Are you for it? No, not me. Not me. Not me. I'm for the king. So actually, we can all be any number of things. But come back to that one. I absolutely believe that Robert Burns was intending to go to the West Indies. And I think he was intending to go for a few years to make some cash and work on a plantation. Just like I've got a dozen people who I know in the Middle East right now earning tax-free dollars that they'll bring back to Scotland. Yeah. So back then, you can say he should have done it, he shouldn't have done it. You simply can't judge people today by 250 years ago. And this is a hobby horse and you can follow me on Twitter, you can do whatever you like. I find it utterly astonishing that we are looking at People. God, Gandhi, Gandhi nearly never got a, stat, got a statue toppled in Manchester because somebody said he said something he didn't like. And he did have some views that were a little bit fruity for today's liking. Yeah? But back then, Burns was in a bind. And Scotland was not just, generally speaking, a poor place. People had nothing. So I don't decry him for going to the West Indies at all. And if he had gone, it would have been, I think, disastrous for him. But I do think we have to... And I know you, weren't, so you were asking me the question. I'm, I'm directing this by... I think that it is very... It is a, a very, very... dangerous thing to do to judge the people of those times by our current moors. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I'll, yeah, 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 yeah. Please do, please do, because some of you may know a lot more about this than me. I'm just bumping my gums here. My point is, to me, it seems a great internal contradiction in Burns because he was such a humanitarian at one level. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, but I love it. But I love that because yeah. here's the interesting thing. He, and and I, I would do this. I would do this if I was doing a business thing. Okay, all look into yourselves. Got any contradictions? I've got a ton of them. I am so imperfect. I am so shit at so many things. There are half a dozen people in here who know I'm terrible at some things. So we're all a mass of contradictions. Take things like, and I alluded to it, this, this you know, people, the, the SUV is the most popular car in the world today. 40% of our SUVs, yet apparently we've got global warming. I regularly speak to people, regularly speak to people who the amount of cognitive dissonance they have over things like anything from global warming to any of the major issues is utterly astonishing because we're basically emotional beings. What was it Nietzsche said? Our emotions are a huge blind monster that goes wherever it wants and our intellect is a tiny sighted being sitting on the emotions' shoulders justifying everything the emotions do. He was a unionist. Yeah? 
He was for independence, both at the same time in the same week sometimes, depending on what uniform he was wearing. And to a certain extent, I think we've all got those. That's why I think I like him when I look into him, because we've all got contradictions. And, and here are the most, here, the uncle good, here are the people you have to watch most in your life, the people who think they're really good. And those are the ones he was most suspicious of as well. Apart from my mum, she really is really good. <laughs> A question on the right. <laughs> Burns wrote in a, a man's man for all that, who surbases be a slave. Um, it sounds as though he thought slaves didn't deserve any better. Yeah, I think again back 250 years ago, and I think again, we're coming back to it a little bit, um, when you're in a bind, and I tried to in one paragraph explain all the things that was happening in his 27th year. You know, two women pregnant, um, and he really loved, and, and I think he really loved Mary Campbell, and he, and he, and he kind of loved Jean Armour. And then the relief that he must have felt when Mary Campbell died, at the same time as, as, fuck, she's died. Yeah, at the same time as trying to do a lease for a farm, and his he's, he's publisher saying, we need another hundred copies of your poem, Rabbi, you're going to write some more poems, you're going to be a rich man. All of that is happening in a very concentrated period of time. And I think if you imagine that yourself, you know, it must have been really, really intense. So I think we've all got contradictions in us, absolutely, and I think Burns was no different from us. But I do think he was going to go. I really do. I think he was going to go, and we can, you can make your own, your own view on that one, but I, yeah, he was. And we're slaves of the same value as everybody else. I mean, of course, there's no hierarchy in the society we have today, is there? <laughs> Jeez, I mean, God, we're stratifying it. We're stratifying it by class, race, gender. I think we're up at 193 genders just now, for God's sake. We are doing it, you know, <laughs> right, left, and center. I can't believe I've just said that out loud. We could be here till 10 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just briefly on the Jean Armour, um, Mary Campbell two-timing. You remember how happy could I be with either what other dear charmer away. However, that's not my question, so I'm cheating. <laughs> What actually I was going to ask you was what you felt about the fantastic Burns industry now. Um, I believe the figures are uh, he brings in over four million to the Scottish economy and the Burns brand brings yep. in 140 million. I, um, I say this with some reluctance because it is my alma mater, yeah. but I do believe that Glasgow University has currently got a project and got a considerable amount of money for a project um, to um, double or treble those yeah. sums. I just wonder what you felt about the commodification of the poet. Oh, bring it on! And I think he would have—I think he would have loved it himself. I think that that um, commodify it as much as you like. You know, it can be as tatty as you like, and you can still. I'm a member of. I'm a director of uh, Sandford Burns Club. I've not been to the meetings for ages. I'm sorry if there's anyone here who's a director. So you can have the highbrow stuff. You can have your burn suppers, and I've done many a big burn supper, but can modify Robert Burns and bring as many tourists here as possible for Robert Burns, for Harry Potter, for Charles Rennie McIntosh and for all the rest. Absolutely bring it on. And um, I do think that uh, Burns is known the world over and we probably could make more of him. We absolutely could make more of him. And I personally don't have any difficulty with that. So you can have the highbrow stuff that is, that is more academic and you can, have, you, can have, you can have all the rest of it as well. Put it, in tea, put it in tea towels. In fact, I think my mum's given me 13 tea towels with Burns poems on them. Yeah? 13? It's only 12. I think maybe it's time for one, two questions. Uh, one at the front here. Uh, what, what, in your opinion, is the reason for his early death? Whoa. Um, I think that I think there was, I think there was, the medicine was, was, was getting much better in that century. I think he was just too early for that. I think some better medical treatment at the end. And I said in the, in the lecture, you really could weep. You've got raging toothache, possibly, I don't know, sepsis in your mouth, and you've got rheumatic, you've got, you've basically got a burst heart. And what does your doctor say? Go to the Solway Firth. Now, have you ever been to the Solway Firth? <laughs> Right? The Solway Firth is not the end of the world, but you can definitely see it from there. 
It is, forget the temperature of the water, it is miserable. And he was told to bathe up to his chest every single day. So there's no question that contributed to it. Um, as somebody who comes from farming background, and, you know, ah, uh, my, 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 Dad's folks were farmers in, in Newton Mearns, not the Mearns in, in, in up north. But, you know, I would go and chop sticks as a young lad and I would bugger about doing the tatties and picking the fruit and all that. But farmers work. I've got relatives who are farmers, two cousins in their 70s. And one story that never made, it made the cut was the funeral of my uncle Gavin in the farm. Yeah. You go to the farmhouse after the funeral. And Hugh, his son, as soon as he arrives at the farm, as soon as he arrives at the farm after the funeral, all the folk are in the big room having empire biscuits and homemade and tea and all the rest of it, and he gets his overalls on and goes and turns to the beast in the buyer. The astonishing amount of hard work that he did from the age of probably four or five, dead for him. Yeah? Sheer volume of work. Um, and I think also Scottish Scotland's climate wouldn't have helped, because it's really interesting. I mean, when was the last time you were properly caught in the rain? like properly drenched and caught in the rain. That will have happened to Burns all the time. Just all the time. And I think all of that was, was cumulative. So bad health care generally, bad health care at the end, from his early life having to do ridiculous amounts of hard labour, that will have given him a, a, a really good constitution. You know, I've got a robust constitution because of my antecedents, but I think the sheer volume of it just contributed to killing them. Absolutely. That'd be my view anyway. Okay, is there any final question? Thank you very much for your talk. I visited Walter Scott's house, who was, I don't know if I was a contemporary or not, because I Nearly. do yeah. literature. But Scott wrote books and made a bloody fortune yep. and built a huge house. Yep. And he lived 20 miles down the road from yep. Burns. So yep. what did Burns do wrong? I, now I'm not, I'm not an expert, I'm seriously not an expert, but I remember seeing a documentary about Walter Scott, and I, I could be way off beam here. Um, I mentioned that his lack of creative imagination, right? Stopped him from simply going to London. As say, let's use a word, as a consultant. Right, as, as, a, as a poet, I mean, there are consultants going to London all the time, I'm one of them, and you can earn much more down there than you do up here today still. So he never, Burns never even did that. This is a bit of a guess, right? Not only was Burns' imagination lacking in terms of not being able to envision that, he wasn't a businessman. He wasn't a businessman. If you look at the way that he was treated by the creatures in Edinburgh, you know, my, my, my dad had an industrial waste company, right? My dad was not an educated man. Do you know what he did if you never paid him for your skip? Excuse my language, he gave you your fucking rubbish back. That's what he did. He literally did that. He, he took a skip of rubbish, he went to somebody's house and I said, Dad, you're not going to do that. He says, I am. <laughs> he took a lorry, he borrowed a lorry permanently that wasn't his because a business was going to go down. So I think he was maybe a bit too soft and I don't think he was commercial enough. I think Walter Scott was a commercial businessman and he nearly went bust once or twice. Yeah? But you've got to speculate to accumulate. We had a board meeting today where in my, my small business we're making big decisions that means investing money and it's always a risk and I think he was extremely risk averse in relation to that and Walter Scott got a bit of production line going there and he saw he saw ahead I, I, I can't, I, no, the future though I can't see a guess in fear I don't think Walter Scott guessed in fear I think he went for it he was like Billy be more Billy that would be it's a little bit of a guess that but I don't think Burns ever saw any of that and again back to an earlier point that's to our advantage because we got him all his poetry here yeah, and not elsewhere, but that would be my, my view. I think Excuse we can squeeze in one last, last question. Uh, just to set the record straight, uh, Sir Walter Scott was a highly acclaimed solicitor in Edinburgh and accountant, and he had a publishing house. Yeah, and, uh, so there he, you go. He did hit lows, but he made it to the top in the end. So that's a, a really well made point, and as much as when Burns went to Edinburgh, right, not only did he not get on with the Edinburgh folk, because he was a bit too rough and ready and not flexible enough, but he didn't have the networks and the connections. And could you imagine going from being an Ayrshire farmer 
into the Society of Edinburgh, and first of all, being a bit of a curiosity in being fated. But what you're saying there is Scott had all the connections to a certain extent, and, and obviously knew how to write a contract, if he was a lawyer. And lawyers still know how to do that. Okay. Yes. Into the Eglinton, into the Eglinton estate. Yeah. So he may never really have, uh, however well known he was, he may never yeah. ever uh, escaped his roots because I'm quite sure uh, some of the more influential people who impinged in his life may have closed doors to him. Uh, well, I, lo I love this. It's, it's, if we've got to finish in this one, it's a lovely one because there was I had some stuff in about Burns' father as well, who was a market gardener and who built his own cottage with his own hands. Yeah, and he did all that. But he simply couldn't get out from under being a, a tenant and scraping a living. Yeah? And I think that Burns' hinterland, as, as you're saying, Burns' hinterland compromised all of that. True? Yeah? But I'm just going to do a little bit of a self-aggrandizing one here then, because I'm going to talk about me. My dad was a lorry driver. My dad, my dad on my birth certificate had the best job description ever in any birth certificate. My dad was a bulldozer driver. <laughs> if your dad has got a better occupation on my, your birth certificate than bulldozer driver, you tell me. My dad was a bulldozer driver who worked so hard he created the biggest industrial waste business in Scotland and sold it. But I tell you what, my business is much easier and much more lucrative than that. And my business is so far removed. I teach, I teach, I teach million pound lawyers how to sell. That is so far removed. So you actually, that goes back to one of my points. I don't think Burns could escape from his hinterland. He wasn't able to do that. He didn't have the imagination to do that. I could easily be running an industrial waste company right now in the west of Scotland and probably be reasonably successful. I'd have a Volvo, lots of brown moccasins and I wouldn't be doing this lecture right now and it would have been fine. But I'm not. The past two jobs I've organised are for the Premier League down in London, a keynote speech, and I'm going straight from there to Barcelona to speak to 150 global surgeons. And it's ridiculous what these rich people are willing to pay for an hour of your time to do that. <laughs> I'm really very disappointed they're so generous. <laughs> so you can escape it if you, if you try. Thank you. We've had an absolutely fabulous talk today, uh, and singing as well. Um, I think the questions ref reflected that. Uh, so I'd just thank uh, Russell in the usual way. Thank you.